Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning into this video. What are we looking at today? Uh, we're going to be just basically going through some steps and a framework for purchasing a UK property whilst living overseas. Um, we put this video together initially for our schools partners, COBIS, British Schools Middle East, as part of a sort of profession, professional development and learning program so that people can learn how to purchase a property without you know any sort of salesy stuff in there, just more of an education and a framework for them, but we thought we'd share it on our YouTube as well. Um, so other people can have the benefit of going through it. So this is the first time we've tried to re record a screen and do a presentation. So apologies if there are any technical errors. Um, okay, so how to purchase UK property whilst living overseas. What are we gonna be looking at? What are we going through? We're going through the steps needed to plan out a property purchase from goal setting through to getting mortgages and how to make an offer, how to find a management company, all of that sort of stuff. Um, this is leaning more towards purchasing an investment property and the steps you need to go through to do that. You can use the same steps. They are the same steps if you want to purchase a house, a home to live in. Um, but here we're trying to get you thinking about some goals and stuff like that. So you can think why you're really purchasing a property if it's for an investment. These are our steps, the way, uh, the way we would do it and the way we have done it recently when we were planning it and purchasing a property to show other people how to do it. So there are, there will be other ways and other people will suggest different ways of doing things. These are just our way of doing it. So, um, so here we go, let's jump in. Okay, so F some of the FAQs we'll aim to cover off in here, uh, some of the reasons why you should stick around to the end and some of the things you might learn, where are the best locations, uh, how setting a good goal will make you, will help you realize where the best locations are. How much of a deposit do I need? That's a very common question we get. Uh, 20 to 30 percent i'll tell you now in case you want to leave uh can i get a mortgage yes i'll tell you that one now yes you can what type of mortgage should i get up to you depends on your goals uh how can i do any of this while living overseas well you can do all of it and it's quite easy actually so uh stick around and i'll show you all right here we go these are the steps we've broken it down into and if you follow these steps in a chronological order um you shouldn't go far wrong so what are we going to do we're going to set some goals or look at goal setting, why, you know, goals, clear, specific, measurable, accurate, relevant, timely, all of that sort of stuff. Those goals are good goals. How setting that goal can help you narrow down and choose a location, getting a mortgage, the steps involved, we'll cover off the power of leverage in there, why leverage is such a powerful tool, the basic costs involved in purchasing a property. So, so you know what to budget for legal process and making an offer. What does that involve? Legal process is known as conveyancing when it comes to property finding a management company and then building a property portfolio long-term and what that might look like. Uh, here we go. So goal setting, this is the first step. And I think it's the most important step. Uh, a good, clear goal will make all the following steps so much easier. And you need to start by asking yourself why you're buying the property. Uh, take time to think about your goals, what you want from it. You know, and once it's clear, Write it down, you know, put it down so you can look at it and come back to it if you need to. For example, is it head versus heart? Is it a home or an investment? You know, we speak to a lot of people or talk to a lot of people and they say, you know, I'd like to buy a property in the UK. I'd like to rent it out when I'm not there during school term time. And I'd like to use it when I'm back. Or, you know, I'd like to rent it out for three or four years. Then when I go back, I'd like to live in it. The best of both worlds. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world that would work, but they are two very different things. You know, what might make an, a good home for you might not necessarily be um, a great rental property. You know, who do you want to rent properties to? You need to buy properties that they want to live in. And the ideal home for you, you know, maybe lots of space for the kids near mum and dad out in the countryside, whatever it may be, that is not necessarily a good investment property. So why are you buying that will determine the type of property you want to buy if it's a home great stick to it leave it as a home don't try and make an investment as well if it's an investment think what do i want from it do i want income now do i want long-term capital appreciation is it a pension play or am i simply trying to get cash in the bank working harder uh, those are some of the things you need to think about for example my goal my goal in this instance and the and the uh, example we're going to run with throughout this presentation is my goal is to buy an investment property and to have it paid off by the tenant. I have around £40,000 in the bank to do this with. This needs to cover all the costs, the deposit, the startup costs. I don't want income from it now, uh, I don't, but I don't want it to cost me anything. I don't want to be putting into it each month. 
I'm buying it for the long term. So it's, it's a pension play for me and I'll buy it. It'll be paid off in 15 years and then I'll enjoy the income from it. That's why I'm buying in this example. Your goals may be different. Okay. When you're setting your goals, be realistic. What can you afford? When can you afford it by? You know, do you need to save up a bit longer? Have you got cash ready to go? Um, you know, these are some of the things you need to consider. When you lay your affordability over your goal and what you're trying to achieve, you'll have a really narrowed down uh, set of properties you can start looking at and a set of criteria. Uh, there you go. So when you lay your goal over your means of achieving it, you have a good roadmap of where to buy. You know, it immediately narrows it down from 100 properties to 10, for example, because you know, if I've only got forty thousand pounds, I'm not going to be buying a million pound property. Five hundred thousand pound property, I'm going to be buying a hundred thirty thousand pound property. So it narrows it down. Here's a little picture of our YouTube page uh, because we've got lots of good content on there about this sort of stuff, uh, about goal setting, all that sort of stuff. So go and have a little, uh, go and have a little look at that if you fancy. Choosing a location. So after you've set some goals, you can you've narrowed down your affordability and what you're trying to achieve. You can choose a location. Uh, here we go. So now that I have a clear goal, I can narrow down my locations based on my affordability and what I want to achieve. So with our budget of 40,000, let's earmark 7,000 pounds for stamp duty. We'll, we'll come back to that later, uh, which leaves us 33,000 pounds as a deposit deposit at 25%. This gives us a property value of 132,000 pounds. So, I know I'm buying and holding it for the long term, so I want a good quality tenant that's going to go in there and pay off the mortgage. I'm looking at around £132,000, so immediately I know to be looking in areas at that price range where I've got good employment, good tenants that are going to go in there and pay it off for me. Where? Not London, not the southeast. Yes, the employment's good, but it's way out of the price range, so I need to be more realistic and looking at the Midlands and further north maybe. How do you decide? I appreciate that's easy for me to say as someone that works in property, but how do you decide? Research, do your research, that is the key. Start reading and researching anything, just Google it. Google best places to invest, start reading. You know, We all know what a good article is, a reliable source is online. Start reading some things and you'll start building up a picture of good places to buy and, and, and some places not to buy. So. Start reading and researching. What are some of the things we use to do our own research and to do the research that we send out to people and base our videos and, and research reports on Zoopla and Rightmove? You know, most people, most people's houses are listed on there or rental properties are listed on there nowadays. So that's a great source of information. Savills and Knight Frank, two brilliant research houses that gather all this information on property prices for you. Look at those. They put reports out each month on house price growth, on rental yields per city uh, by region. So you can really start and, if, and prices as well. So you can really start building up uh, an idea of price points, rental yields, uh, house price growth, all that sort of stuff. As well as these guys, get onto YouTube, follow some channels. Uh, you can have a look at ours if you want. You can have a look at people like the Property Hub. They're, they're very good. There's uh, people like Jamie York. There's loads of other really good property education people out there on the internet. So go and have a look at them and, and see what they say. Oh, lastly, we've got the APW resources video, which is a video we put together, which takes you through all the resources we use and our clients use when, when they're researching and making buying decisions. So check that out on our YouTube. Use these things to build a, a, a picture of where you can buy, buy and what's realistic. Once you have that, then you can do a deep dive What's this? Once you have an idea of locations uh, that might be the most affordable and suit your goals, you can start researching these specific locations using things like Zoopla, Rightmove, Purple Bricks. There are others out there. Spend time seeing what's available at your price point in those cities or regions, and then do a bit of research, spend a bit of time on a Saturday morning, compare the properties at that price point in that city. You know, why is one street cheaper than another? What are the rental incomes? Look at the rental section on these property websites. Email local estate agents, ask them what's available, ask them for good, for good buying locations, tell them your investors, see what they say. Where are the good schools? Where are good transport links? All of this sort of stuff. And you can use again, right, move Zoopla and Google Maps uh, are the things we use for all of that. And if you look here in this lovely picture here is a video we put up on our YouTube where we did 
exactly this. We researched a location in Nottingham with a budget of £130,000 and found some perspective uh, potential properties to invest in. We eventually bought one and you can go and see that whole series on our YouTube if you want to see exactly how we spent a Saturday morning researching a property purchase. Right, so we've done that. We've got our goals. We've got our, um, we found our, lo our location and our potential properties, some streets maybe, or some regions within that city. What do we need to do? We need to get a mortgage. Ooh, tricky. This is one we always get asked about. Can I get a mortgage as an expat? I live in Dubai. Can I get a mortgage? I've been in China for 10 years. I don't have a UK credit rating, credit score. What can I do? Short answer is yes. Yes, you can. Why is it important? Well, obviously, you know, unless you've got heaps and heaps of cash in the bank, you need a mortgage to purchase property. So this is an important step. The first thing I would recommend doing is getting a decision in principle or a DIP. This is basically where you speak to a broker, a mortgage broker, and they get the basics of your situation from you, your earnings, your outgoings, all that sort of stuff. They then go and speak to some banks and building societies that they know might accept your case. And then those guys will come back with a decision in principle, which is basically saying, yeah, we like the look of this person. Uh, we're willing to offer them 75% mortgage on these terms. Uh, that's a decision in principle. It's not, it's not the start of, it's not a mortgage happening. It's just them saying, yes, we're willing to do it. Why is that important? Well, firstly, you need it when offering in a, in a hot property market. Um, if you're going to have your offer taken seriously, if you've got a decision in principle in place and you can show your proof of deposit, then you're going to be taken very seriously versus someone that hasn't got a decision in principle in place because you've invested a bit of time and you show that you're ready to go. Also, whilst you're doing this decision in principle, it might throw up some, some things that you didn't know about. You know, we've got clients we've met with that say that have tried to get a mortgage and say they've got a CCJ, which is a county court juncture, something they didn't realize, or a, a mobile phone bill that wasn't paid that might stop them from being able to get a mortgage. So doing this is really important because it, it shows you if you can get a mortgage and if you can't, where you're going wrong. And don't panic. If you have got things like that, then it's easy to overcome and you can still get mortgages which means we need to look at different lenders. So there we go. That's why that's important. That's free to do. You can speak to any mortgage broker. They'll do a decision in principle for you. We can put you in touch with people uh, that specialize with working in expats, or you could just Google it and you'd probably find some good ones. What do you need if, if you decide to go ahead with the decision in principle? Three months pay slips, three months bank statements, uh, a employment letter, and a proof of address. So... And a, and a passport. So show who you are, where you live, and then proof of your earnings. Because I say three months, sometimes it's six, but these mortgage companies, because it's a buy to let, uh, want to know that if there was no tenant in there that you could afford to cover the rental income with your income. It's part of the stress testing, the increased stress testing post uh, global financial crisis 2007 and eight. So that's what you need. It's not, a, it's not an awful lot. You will need to get it notarized. Um, so be prepared to do that. Typical banks that work with expats. Again, another common thing we get is, you know, I was back home over Christmas or over summer and I went and spoke to Nat West or I went and spoke to Lloyd's and they said, there's no way they'll lend to me. Well, they won't because they're based in the UK and they've got enough people there to lend to. So you need to work with banks and building societies and lenders that are happy to work with expats. People like Skipton's, Bank of China, Saffron Building Society, Al Ryan, HSBC Offshore, NatWest Offshore, the offshore versions of these banks and building societies, Leeds Building Society, Dudley Building Society, the list goes on, there's loads of them. At the moment, typical rates, we're getting between two and 3.5 or two and four for buy to let, which is very good. And then lastly, interest only or interest in repayment. What's the best way? Well, this, this again depends on your goals. If you're trying to pay it off over the long term, like we are in this example, we'll go for interest and repayment. If you're trying to build an income immediately, then you might just go for interest only. Power of leverage. This is a great tool and another reason why you should, you know, if you're buying property, you should buy with, with a mortgage. Some quick figures here. A £30,000 deposit, that buys us a £100,000 property. You get a 6% yield from that property, which is £6,000 per annum rental income keep the figures sim simple, uh, which is actually 20%, a 20% return on your £30,000 deposit. So you've leveraged it up. Let's say you get some capital appreciation as well, and the property goes up by 5%. 
they've gone up 10% in the past 12 months. So that's realistic. That 5% is 5,000 pounds on a hundred thousand pound property, which is the equivalent to 16% uh, return on your initial deposit. Plus inflation erodes the real value of the debt. So what is a 70,000 pound loan going to be worth in 10 years time? Not the same in real terms as it is now. There you go. Cost, just a quick one on cost. So you've done your goal setting, you've got your location, you've got your mortgage decision in principle. What are the costs you need to consider the startup costs? There will be people that say you need this, you know, maybe this little cost or that little cost. I think these are the bare bones basic costs you need. You've got your deposit, your stamp duty. This is at 3% because it's a buy to let, then another 2% because you're an overseas investor. That may put some people off, but if you're buying and holding for the longer term, then it's not really much of an issue. You know, you'll see that growth within a year, uh, no problem. Legal fees around a thousand pounds, mortgage arrangement fee, 500 to a thousand pounds. So on our example from the start on our 132,000 pound property, this would be 33,000 pound deposit, 6,600 stamp duty, 1,000 legals, 1,000 mortgage, which leaves a total of 41,600. And we said we'd earmark 40,000 at the start. So there's a video on this as well. If you want more information, guys, there's a video on this on our YouTube where we go into a bit more detail on how you can plan it and break it down. Legal process and making an offer. This can seem quite daunting because, um, you know, legals, property legals, you assume lots of paperwork and all that sort of stuff. If you get a decent legal team, they'll do all of this for you, a conveyancing team as it's known. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of the legal team, the legal process, because I believe if you find a good legal company, then as I say, they'll do it all for you. So. How can you find a good legal team? Again, it's really simple, just like researching your locations. You do a bit of research, type it into Google, conveyancing teams in Nottingham, if that's where you're buying, conveyancing teams in, in Inverness, conveyancing teams in Liverpool, whatever it may be. Do some research, make a short list, read their reviews, give them a call, see what they like. Are they nice, friendly people? Do they answer the first time? If they don't answer, do they call you back? Decide who you'd be happy working with and instruct them to act for you. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, again, the investment from you will be a bit of time. You know, there, there is time involved in purchasing a property, but once you've done it, you know, you don't need to do anything. You can forget about it and leave it. If you want to see exactly how we did that, then you can watch our YouTube video here, conveyancing and submitting an offer where we made a short list. You see this one's legal team number three. We made a short list of three legal companies and we called them all and you can see how that went down. One of them was not very polite. One didn't answer. Uh, and then the other one was very polite and very good. And those are the ones we went for. So it's as simple as that. Making an offer. This is really important, especially in a hot market like we have at the moment, there's so much competition going on. If you're not offering with a strong offer, you're going to be gazumped and someone else will get in. Before you, this is obviously the case in secondhand property, you know, existing property. If you're buying off plan, then you don't really have this issue. Um, again, go and check out some videos on other people's YouTubes or ours about that. But how can you make a strong offer? This is the same, whether it's buy to let or residential property, whether you're buying a home or, or an investment, you need a strong offer. So you need your decision in principle, which we've got, cause we've done our mortgage. We need a proof of funds, proof of deposit, which is just a bank statement, photocopy of that, or it's not photocopy nowadays, is it? It's a, a screenshot or a PDF. Uh, you need your offer, what you're actually going to offer for it. And a brief, I think a brief overview of your situation, just to give people a bit of a, a bit of context about what you're doing. Call the estate agent, make a verbal offer, take their email, follow up with an email offer. And just like Blue Peter, Here's what I made earlier. Uh, so this is when we were offering on our Nottingham property that we did in our mini series on, on YouTube. So I'm looking, um, uh, I'm looking for someone to help me purchase property in Nottingham. I'm based in Malaysia. The property is for buy to let it's valued at this 135 decision in principle. So this, sorry, this is, um, this is for the legal team asking for a legal team to, to get on side and, and, um, represent you. If it was the deposit email, then it would be, you know, I'm buying a 132,000 pound property. 
I've got a 25% deposit. Here's a, my proof of funds. I've got a decision in principle for that amount. Here's my decision in principle. I'm overseas. I'm not in a chain. I'm ready to go. If you accept my offer, we can send the cash and send the deposit straight away. So stack the chips in your favor when you're making an offer. Finding a management team. Okay, this is important, very important, because you don't want to go through all of that and then try and manage it yourself. Or as we hear often, oh, well, you know, my brother's down the road or my parents are down the road, they can manage it for me. Unless they run a property management company and they are professionals in doing it, then I wouldn't suggest using them. You know, you want a professional, you want to pay them their fee, which isn't an awful lot of money for them to do this. Managing your property can be hard and take a lot of time, even if you're local to the property, let alone when you're on the other side of the world. Um, hire a professional who will take care of the whole thing for you, finding tenants, putting tenants in place, collecting rent, managing tenants, dealing with their requests, all that sort of stuff. Again, find one that works with expats. The amount of people we've met with who have said, I did have property, but I sold it after I moved overseas because the hassle of owning it uh, was so difficult. You know, I was getting calls in the middle of the night about boilers breaking down, about tenants, about this, that, and the other. And that's all because they're working with management companies that don't know the situations of expats. Um, I think this is less common now because there are more and more investors living overseas. So you want to find one that's familiar, that's not going to be calling you in the middle of the night, that's going to be taking care of things without contacting you and, and you're taking up your time. You want to put the tenant in there and forget about it. We don't want it to be another job. So work with people that know how difficult it can be uh, whilst you're overseas. What do they charge? Typically, they'll charge you between 8 and 14% of your rental income per month to do this. It is totally worth it and worth every penny. I think the sweet spot is probably about 10 to 12. In the southeast, it's 14, 16%, but 10 to 12 is where most, most people sit. Um, here you go. How do you do that? Again, there's another one for your Saturday morning list is do a bit of research. Start by Googling uh, management companies in the area. You can see the video we did here on it. Check out our YouTube to watch that full, that full video. Um, property management agents in Nottingham, you can see we Googled there. We made a short list of three or four. We read some of the reviews. You see this one here, all good reviews. Something you should look at when you're reading reviews, is it a landlord focus or a tenant focus? You know, so all the reviews from tenants or are there reviews from landlords saying great to work with? I was looking out for landlords focus because obviously that's what I want and that's what you, you would be doing too. Narrow down the list, call them, speak to them. You know, they're a management company. It's a people company, not so much like the legal team where you just want them to do the legals effectively. These people are going to be managing tenants for you. They're going to be dealing with you. So you want good, friendly people, people. So I called all, I called them, spoke to them and um, just sort of saw what they were like and how helpful they were and then made a decision from there. Um, we've got a full yeah, 21 minute video on our YouTube where we go into more detail on this. So if you want to watch that, then go over there and you can see how we did the research and how we did it all. And you know, it doesn't take that long. It's a 21 minute video and it probably took an hour to make the video. So uh, there we go. Right, so we've, we've done all of that. We've got a management company. We've set our goals. We've got a mortgage. We've um, found a legal team. We've offered on the property. It's been accepted and we've got a management company. It's in place. There's a tenant in there. Job done. You know, they're paying the mortgage. They're covering our costs. And we can just sit back and forget about it. We can leave it there or, or we can look at trying to build it up. If, it, if, as it was in our goal at the start, it was a longer term sort of pension idea, then we want to build it up and ideally add to this, you know, whilst we're working and earning good money overseas. So the property's completed on, there's a tenant in place, the property will pay itself off over 15 years, that's 20. How can we build this up? As an example, if we purchase one every two years for the next 10 years, they'd all be paid off in 25 years from now. Again, this may not suit, uh, it depends on your goals. You know, if you're wanting to retire in five years, then you don't want to be taking your mortgages that are paid off in 25 years. This is just an example. So you've got uh, all of these paid off in 25 years. Let's say they're purchased at £100,000 to keep the figures easy. Uh, in 25 years, they'd be valued at £300,000. 
I know you say that probably sounds like quite a lot, but if you look at house price data over the past 25 years, they've grown at 400% plus in, in most regions. And you look at the data before that, it's continuously rapid growth, which why over the long term, property is such a good buy. So we can assume uh, with our portfolio now, we've got a portfolio value of 1.5 million paid off in 25 years time at a yield of 5%. That's going to be giving an income of 75,000 pounds per annum. Yes, those, are, you know, that's very sort of high level figures, but it gives you an idea of the power of how you can build it up. And, you know, you've leveraged all that cash, so you've not paid all of that in full. Uh, and then when you add stuff like, you know, your national insurance, your other, other various pensions and streams of income, you're getting a really good healthy income. So uh, that's just to help show how you can try and build it up. Here we go, we made it through to the end, the summary. Thanks for sticking with it. Um, there we have it, your checklist for purchasing a property. Set your goals, clear, clear specific goals. Once you've got your clear goals and, and what you can afford to purchase those properties, you'll have a sort of clear framework of the price, the price point, which then gives you a clear indication of where you can buy and the type of property you need to buy. Do your mortgage research and get a decision in principle. See if you can get a mortgage, address those issues if you can't, get a decision in principle if you can. Make an offer on a property, find a legal team. As that's going ahead, find a management company, do a bit of research, uh, put them in place. And then the last one, the best one, sit back and enjoy the income. So summary, key takeaways. What would we say, what I say would be the key things to take away from that? Have a clear plan, goals and reasons for buying. A clear plan will really narrow everything down for you. Not again, the wishy-washy, I'd like it to be a home, I'd like it to be investment, you know, it's one or the other and, and set a clear goal for it. Secondly, do your research. You may have noticed most steps there were very research-based, research your locations, research your goals, research management companies. All this information is out there on the internet and you can do it, research it yourself. You can watch our videos, you can watch other people's videos and we'll help show you how to do that. Thirdly, leverage experts. Use people that are professionals and know what they're doing. You know, don't use mates to manage manage properties. Don't use UK mortgage brokers. Use a specific expat mortgage broker who knows what they're doing and does this on a day to day basis. Use a management company that's familiar with working with expats, so won't cause you extra hassle. It's worth working with professionals. And lastly, give it a go. Get going. Jump into it. Uh, the longer you wait, uh, you know, the longer you're missing out on any potential growth in the market. So um, get into it, even if it's just researching and familiarizing yourself with it. So there we go. What can you do if you'd like more information? Uh, obviously, you can check out all the, all the APW stuff. We've got a podcast that comes out every Monday, which is a longer podcast than then every Thursday where we answer questions that have been sent in to us. So there's that. That's on Spotify and the other places you get your podcasts. You've got the APW Market Brief, which is this one here which is a sort of a brief, a summary of the market. It's a five, six minute read. We put it out every week. And then finally our YouTube channel as well. A couple of videos every week going out there, all with an educational focus. Also that you could go and watch it, read it, learn about it, and then go and do it yourself if you wanted to. Um, there's heaps and heaps of other resources out there outside of us, obviously. Just Google it, just go on YouTube and start watching some videos. And you'll start familiarizing yourself with everything and hopefully you'll gain, not, gain enough knowledge to be able to go in and do it yourself and, and make a purchase. Uh, how should we wrap it up? I suppose go and follow those channels. If you've got any questions or you'd like to speak to us or pick our brains on anything, get in touch. There's a, a link below in the description where you can sign up to the brief, the podcast and, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, obviously. And there's also an email if you want to have a chat with us. Um, there you go. Hope you found, found that useful. The basic steps involved in researching, planning and purchasing a property in the UK whilst living overseas. Thanks. Bye.